Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Right. Welcome everyone to lecture number 45 and the second part of microbial metabolism. We are going to look at uh, how the cells derive energy from different uh, combinations of electron donors and acceptors. So let us revise a little bit about uh, oxidation reduction reactions just in case you have forgotten. So here we have hydrogen and when hydrogen is um, the half reaction for hydrogen is two protons and two electrons. So this is called the electron donating half reaction. And then we have oxygen. So when oxygen picks up these electrons, this becomes the electron accepting half reaction. It's very important for all of us to keep in mind that for any organism to survive, it is the combination of electron donor and electron acceptor. If that combination of two half reactions is energy yielding, then the organism is going to get the energy it needs for survival and reproduction. So here is our net reaction for the formation of water. And you know that if you were to put these two gases together, you will automatically get water. So this is both exergonic as well as uh, spontaneous reaction. So H2 in this case is the reductant or the electron donor. It gets oxidized and oxygen is the oxidant or the electron acceptor. It gets reduced. So this is the simplest oxidation reduction reaction that we can uh, think about. It also tells us something about how to measure the reduction potential. So the tendency to give up electrons and get, get oxidized is basically what we are measuring when we measure the reduction potential. It is always measured with reference to hydrogen and for pH 7. Having understood the importance of oxidation reduction reactions, we also need to understand how we generally write them. So conventionally, we write the oxidant or the oxidized form on the left and the reductant or the reduced form on the right. So these are examples of that. So here you have carbon dioxide and glucose. Carbon dioxide is converted to glucose in the photosynthesis process and glucose is converted to CO2 in the aerobic respiration process. So no matter which reaction is happening, it does not matter, this is the way we write it. So here we have the electron tower and what you see are the most negative uh, redox values or the electron potential at the top and the most positive values at the bottom. Now what is important to note is that electrons released from the top of the tower are caught by the uh, electron acceptors at the bottom of this uh, electron tower. So the greater the fall of electrons, the greater the amount of energy released in terms of electrical uh, potential which can then be converted to chemical energy in the form of ATP. So you can see that the greatest distance is from glucose to oxygen. So the top and the bottom if you combine those two, that is where the greatest release of energy is going to be. So if I can, um, I'll just say it instead of writing it, if you have glucose plus oxygen going to CO2 and water, that is nothing but a combination of these two half reactions. The first one is the top one and at the bottom you have O2 going to water. So the highest release of energy happens in aerobic respiration when you have a compound that is highly biodegradable like glucose combining with oxygen and going to CO2 and water. So that is one example. Now let us take some other examples to make it clearer. Now let us take number one uh, that's shown over here. Here we have 
uh, hydrogen which will act as the electron donor so it's in reverse so this is in reverse hydrogen gas going to a protons and it's being combined with fumarate going to succinate so it's not a big fall it's a small fall so you can see the literally the distance along the electron tower so the delta g value for this reaction is minus 86 kilojoules okay and then you have um, hydrogen again combined with nitrate the fall of electrons is a little bit more yes and you have delta g0 dash as minus 163 kilojoules and finally you have the combination of hydrogen with oxygen going to water and that is the second reaction going all the way down this one is the arrow is not correct um, the arrow goes further down to the last reaction and that releases minus 237 kilojoules now these are examples of the two uh, half reactions being combined to release a lot of energy so there are hydrogen utilizing organisms or bacteria that can use hydrogen as the electron donor and these three fumarate nitrate or oxygen as the electron acceptors so these are the combinations that you can um, think about that these are these examples so i've already mentioned that bacteria survive by obtaining energy from the pairing of electron donors with electron acceptors and then we come to the yield the yield in general is assumed to be the yield let's first take the definition of the yield yield is the amount of biomass produced per unit of substrate consumed and this is generally considered to be proportionate to the delta g0 for the oxidation reduction reactions when you combine the electron donors and the acceptors so like i said glucose and oxygen is the best example of aerobic respiration and it's also the proof that no other terminal electron acceptor in combination with any of the other organic compounds is going to give you a higher yield in terms of biomass or in terms of energy so we we can do some calculations in the next topic when we come to that so i've said most of what i wanted to say here now let's come to electron carriers so we know that the electron donors are the energy source in the catabolic reactions in reality it's the combination the very often in the literature you'll find uh, statements that the electron donors are the energy source but it actually is the combination of the two that releases energy there may be sufficient energy in the electron donor by itself but that's not what we are going to to. what we are going to do uh, in your assignment is to calculate delta g's for three different reactions um, you can use two uh, two different textbooks so we have sawyer mccarty and perkin that is one textbook and the second textbook uh, that has similar calculations is brock and uh, brock's tech, uh, biology okay so now remember what is happening in the entire electron transport process where what is the electron transport process and why is it important the first thing is here we have the example of glucose going to uh, glucose along with oxygen going to co2 and water now glucose the oxidation state of carbon in glucose is zero the oxidation state by definition uh, for oxygen uh, gas is also zero and here in co2 carbon has plus four oxygen has minus two same thing in water so you can see that the primary electron donor is glucose so this is our glucose molecule now how many electrons has glucose donated in going to co2 so here this is c6 we have six carbon dioxides and it has gone from zero to plus four so six times four is 24 electrons so glucose has donated 24 electrons what is the compound that has accepted these 24 electrons after all they are not floating around they have been accepted in equal amount 
So here we have oxygen which has an oxidation state of 0 and it has gone to minus 2 in carbon dioxide and minus 2 in water as well. So those 24 electrons have been picked up by oxygen in both CO2 as well as in water. So that is our terminal electron acceptor. So oxygen is our terminal electron acceptor and the primary electron donor is glucose. Now, how is this transfer of electrons happening? Is it a direct transfer? Is it a one reaction transfer? The answer is far from it. The answer to this uh, reaction, this reaction is an extremely simplistic uh, description of what happens in reality. There are a large number of enzyme mediated reactions where there are carriers like NAD+, FAD+, all these carriers come into play in transferring electrons from the donor to the acceptor. So we are going to go through all of it and try to understand what is important in terms of um, the process, the biochemical process of uh, transferring electrons and generating ATP. Some people would say this is biochemistry not microbiology. But to understand the bacteria and why they are capable of doing so many different things in so many different environments, you need to understand the basis of it. And this um, understanding of electron transport is crucial to the understanding of biodiversity within the bacterial species, uh, within bacteria. So I was saying that there are two types of carriers, fixed and freely diffusible. So the fixed carriers are the ones that are membrane associated enzymes that are part of the electron transport reactions. And you also have freely diffusible carriers like NAD plus and NADP plus that are capable of donating and accepting both protons and electrons or the entire hydrogen atom as a whole. So you can see NAD plus going to NADH, you can see the electron uh, potential as well as NADP plus and NADPH. So here we have the chemical structure of NADH and when there is a proton, uh, what it will do is, it, like I said, it reverses between NADH and NAD plus or if it is associated with a phosphate like I've shown over here. So here at the C2 position, the phosphate can be added here. In that case, it's NADP plus and it can pick up a hydrogen atom and become NADPH, okay. So these are the two forms and here one hydrogen and an electron from the nitrogen will be removed along with the proton and you get two hydrogen atoms. So you can see the plus um, uh, charge at the nitrogen over here the loss of uh, hydrogen at the opposite end of the ring and that is basically how it reverses um, its oxidation state and that's how it transfers both protons and electrons in the electron transport chain. So now that we know that we have different carriers for transporting electrons and we al also realize that this electron transport process is how energy is going to be generated in the form of ATP. So chemical energy which is released in the redox reactions has to be stored in high energy phosphate or in some cases in sulfate bonds. So we have ATP and ADP. These are both high energy bonds. AMP on the other hand is a low energy bond. Then we have phosphoenol pyruvate. We have 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate as well as acetyl phosphate. These are all examples of high energy bonds. ATP concentration in an actively growing cell is 2 millimolar. <coughs> Storage granules of organic polymers can be oxidized using ATP when there is nutrient starvation in the environment or rather when the environment has low levels of nutrients. These compounds can, these high level energy containing compounds um, can provide energy for endergonic reactions and that's why they are so important. And then finally, 
we have phosphorylation so low energy phosphate bonds are formed in what is called substrate level phosphorylation so you have glucose 6 phosphate so that is i think i have some examples yes so in this slide you can see the low energy bonds they have delta g0 values less than 30 kilojoules so amp adenosine monophosphate and glucose 6 phosphate are low energy bonds the high energy bonds are all shown over here these are anhydride bonds so you have atp you have phosphoenol pyruvate you have um, acetyl phosphate and you have um, acetyl coa so we will be looking at all of these compounds when we try to understand how energy is generated by the bacteria or other organisms in uh, various uh, redox reactions so for understanding how energy is generated we need to have some understanding of the biochemical pathways now there are several methods that uh, organisms can use for deriving energy so we know that there are chemotrophs these organisms are the ones that use chemicals as energy sources or electron donors now they can use it in two pathways you have respiration or fermentation within respiration you have two pathways aerobic or anaerobic now organic compounds are oxidized and energy is generated and conserved in the form of atp we all know that let's take a look at these two pathways okay so these are the two basic pathways respiration and fermentation our starting compound remains our favorite we all like sugar that's glucose so let's stick to it right so here we have glucose as our starting point this glucose is a c6 molecule this c6 molecule has to be broken down into a c3 molecule pyruvic acid is a c3 molecule so this process of converting glucose from c6 to c3 is called glycolysis and in this process atp as well as nadh is being generated now at the point at which pyruvic acid is generated there are two choices that the organism can make depending on the availability of electron acceptors so you have pyruvic acid now if pyruvic acid is directly converted to fermentation uh, products in fermentation what happens is that there is no external electron acceptor so if you remember the glucose plus oxygen going to co2 and water there our electron donor is glucose electron acceptor is oxygen and co2 and water are the end products in, in fermentation pyruvic acid is not combining with any external electron acceptor so there is no oxygen and there is no substitute for oxygen so it's just pyruvic acid which is a c3 uh, compound and it will eventually be converted into other fermentation products i will show you some examples of that in a little bit the other choice is respiration so now this pyruvic acid enters what is called the krebs cycle so in krebs cycle the first thing that happens is that pyruvic acid before it enters the krebs cycle that c3 molecule is going to be converted to a c2 molecule called acetyl coa coenzyme a attached to an acetyl uh, group so this acetyl coa is a c2 molecule now this c2 molecule comes into the krebs cycle so this pyruvic acid which is a c3 molecule has to be converted first to a c2 uh, molecule which is what happens in the first step so you have acetyl coa where c3 is converted to a c2 compound this c2 compound enters this citric acid cycle or krebs cycle and two and it and is converted into two more carbon dioxide molecules so the entire c3 molecule has now been uh, completely oxidized completely mineralized to three carbon dioxide molecules so whether you include this first step of combining it with uh, acetyl or generating acetyl coa or whatever you want to do um, so this krebs cycle in all cases the first uh, step 
you also get NADH and ATP generation. Second step, you again get in the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle, you will produce ATP and CO2 and reduce NAD plus to NADH, yes. And NADH and FADH2 from both processes will carry these electrons through the electron transport chain. And when these electrons and protons are being carried through the electron transport chain, two things are happening. Protons are being pumped out of the membrane to generate proton motive force and the electrons are passed on from one carrier to another to produce ATP. So this is a very rough and clear schematic of what is happening. And like I said, the level of details, you can keep probing into more and more details to get better uh, understanding of this. But we, are, we will go through some about, uh, amount of that in the subsequent topics. Um, I need to say one more thing. Now, that is respiration. Now, respiration is defined as the situation where pyruvic acid, so the first part is common to both. Respiration and fermentation, glucose is converted to pyruvic acid. Two, um, two molecules of pyruvic acid are generated from one molecule of glucose. First step common to both pathways. Within respiration, there are different terminal electron acceptors that are um, used. So, if the terminal electron acceptor is molecular oxygen, then it is called aerobic respiration. If the organism uses an inorganic substance other than oxygen like nitrate, sulfate, carbonate, if these are the terminal electron acceptors, then it is called anaerobic respiration. So, in the absence of oxygen, it is called anaerobic respiration. The pathways are the same. The biochemical pathways will be the same, but it is the electron acceptor at the end of the electron transport chain is different. Okay. So, you get a higher ATP yield. I have already shown you the electron tower. Glucose at the top, oxygen at the bottom, there is no higher yield. So, as long as there is oxygen in the environment, most of the bacterial species will utilize organic carbon, combine it with oxygen and get the highest possible at energy yield. This is done through two processes, oxidative phosphorylation and substrate level phosphorylation. We will take a look at both of them. In aerobic as well as anaerobic respiration, you can get complete oxidation or partial oxidation. Both can happen for the organic compound. I have already mentioned that glucose gets completely oxidized to CO2. So, that is an example of complete oxidation. You can have partial oxidation. So, you can have um, the organic compound being partially oxidized. So, it does not go to CO2. It may stop at some intermediate. However, you do not get any reduction of the organic co compound. So, the defining uh, point about respiration is, the defining point about respiration is that the organic compound is not reduced. It is either partially or completely oxidized. In fermentation, in contrast to respiration, there is no external terminal electron acceptor. So, the same organic compound, whether it is pyruvate, whether it is acetate, whether it is uh, glucose, whatever it is, it is going to be partially oxidized and partially reduced. So, half of it will be reduced, half of it will be oxidized. Whatever is being generated in the, whatever electrons are being generated in the oxidation uh, reaction will be picked up in the reduction reaction. So, small amounts and because it is, there is no combination with an external terminal electron acceptor, so very small amounts of energy are released because you get only partial oxidation of the organic compound. Now, the oxidation is coupled to the reduction reaction of the same compound. ATP is generated in one process only and that is substrate level 
phosphorylation. There is no oxidative phosphorylation. So glucose can be converted to ethanol, it, uh, lactose can be converted to lactic acid and it basically ends there. Uh, this slide shows us uh, some examples of industrial or commercial applications of fermentation. So we have the starting material in the first column, the fermentation end products in the second column, the industrial or commercial application in the third column and in the last column we have the microorganism, the name of the microorganism or the species that is responsible for this uh, fermentation reaction. So for example, the production of beer is uh, started using malt extract, the fermentation product is ethanol and uh, the mediating enzyme or the enzyme that's responsible for this reaction is Saccharomyces cerevisiae which is a yeast or a fungi. Then we have grape or other fruit juices which are used for making wine and again the fermentation end product is ethanol and the same fungi is used for mediating this reaction. In the last case, we have agricultural waste which can be converted to fuel. So we have um, uh, biodiesel production that is um, that has become very popular. It's especially popular in India, Brazil, US, all these places. Agricultural waste is now not just agricultural waste but even certain crops are used uh, for converting and generating fuel. And again, these are uh, reactions that are mediated by yeast uh, or uh, fungi. Then we have uh, the starting material when it is ethanol, it can be converted to acetic acid. That's what we call vinegar. Commercially, it's sold as vinegar and the microorganism responsible for it is acetobacter. Our next example is milk. Milk can be converted by fermentation to uh, the fermentation end product will be lactic acid and the industrial products are cheese and yogurt. Now these uh, processes are mediated by microbes like lactobacillus and streptococcus. Then we come to cabbage. Cabbage is converted to sauerkraut which is a very popular uh, food material and that is uh, uh, generated using lactobacillus plantarum. Lactic acid can be converted to propionic acid and carbon dioxide in the production of Swiss cheese and uh, we have the name of the microorganism responsible for this that's propioni bacter uh, bacterium species. Molasses which comes from sugarcane can be converted to acetone and butanol. Um, these are uh, both pharmaceutical as well as industrial applications. Uh, the microorganism responsible is clostridium acetobutylicum and uh, molasses can be converted to glycerol. Again, there are pharmaceutical as well as industrial applications and the mediating uh, microorganism is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, we have molasses being converted to citric acid which is used as a flavoring agent and that is done by another fungi aspergillus. Then we have acetic acid which is converted to methane to produce biogas and that is methanosarcina and sorbitol is converted to sorbose which is used in the production of vitamin C which is ascorbic acid and the mediating microbe is gluconobacter. We now come to ATP synthesis. Now ATP, how is ATP generated by the bacteria or any of the other organisms? So energy that is derived from the combination of electron donors and electron acceptors has to be conserved whether it's a fermentation pathway or a respiration pathway. So like I said in fermentation ATP synthesis happens only in that first step of glycolysis and that is a re that results from substrate level phosphorylation. We will go into that when we go into glycolysis which is also called the emden meyerhoff pathway. A phosphate group is attached to some intermediate in the biochemical pathway to result in a high energy phosphate uh, group. So that's called, um, that's called phosphorylation. So it's called substrate level phosphorylation because the organic compound, whether it's glucose or any other starting organic compound, phosphate will attach itself to that organic compound and that's why it's called substrate level phosphorylation. Now this is common to both 
uh, respiration as well as fermentation. What is not common to both is the next one and that is called oxidative phosphorylation. So in respiration, the cytoplasmic membrane is energized by the proton motive force. So in the respiration pathway, the cytoplasmic membrane has to be first energized by the proton motive force. And I already explained in the previous topic, in the previous module that uh, the NADH um, carriers which are capable of accepting and donating both protons and electrons, they will help to pump out protons to the, out, uh, to the outer side of the uh, cytoplasmic membrane. So you can see that very clearly over here. In respiration, the cytoplasmic membrane or the plasma membrane is energized by the proton motive force. And we have already seen in the previous topic that this proton motive force is generated by these uh, complexes. Three of them are shown over here and the fourth one is ATP synthase. And you can see that protons are pumped out from the cytoplasm to the outer side of the plasma membrane. So that is the first thing, that is the energizing of the membrane. Now these electrons that are with NADH, these electrons are transferred from one carrier to another. So you can see several carriers associated with the plasma membrane are going to transfer electrons from one carrier to the other. In the end, these electrons will come back into the cytoplasm and along with, the, uh, and along with ADP, as well as oxygen or whatever else the terminal electron acceptor is, at this stage ADP will combine with phosphate utilizing the proton motive force, generate ATP using this ATP synthase enzyme and the terminal electron acceptor will pick up all these electrons through the electron transfer chain and you will get reduction of this, um, whether it's oxygen or nitrate, uh, sulfate, carbonate, whatever it may be. Okay. So this is the coupling of the proton motive force to ATP synthesis and we have seen some of that in the previous topic. So we have two pathways, we have respiration and fermentation and like I said substrate level phosphorylation is common to both pathways. Okay. So here we see an example of substrate level phosphorylation. So you have your substrate, it can be glucose or any other organic compound, it gets converted, a phosphate is added to that intermediate and a new compound is formed. Um, for example, glucose 6-phosphate is a low energy bond, so less energy is utilized here. Actually, I should rephrase that. Uh, for example, in uh, glycolysis, glucose is phosphorylated and you get a low energy bond in terms of glucose 6-phosphate utilizing an ATP. So a glucose 6-phosphate, like I said, uh, is generated in glycolysis. It's a low energy bond. Uh, an ATP molecule is utilized in the process. So that's an example of substrate level phosphorylation. And like I said, glycolysis is common to both respiration and fermentation. Now another ADP molecule is added, another phosphate is attached to it from these phosphorylated organic compounds. So this phosphate that is attached to an organic compound which is an intermediate in the glycolysis uh, pathway that will be then added to an ATP to generate ADP to generate ATP. Okay, so these are all examples of substrate level phosphorylation and this is the only thing that fermentative bacteria can do. Then we come to oxidative phosphorylation. So this is another example of that. So you can see the proton motive force. There, are, there is a higher concentration of protons on the outside of the membrane compared to the inside and just like your dry cell where you have a um, concentration gradient of electrons that are being generated, so we call it the electron motive force. In this case, you have the proton motive force. So this proton motive force is then channeled back through ATP synthase to generate ATP. So this is your less energized membrane where ADP with one phosphate is converted to ATP and that's what I showed in the previous slide. So here you have phototrophs, photophosphorylation is used in photosynthesis 
and it is similar to oxidative phosphorylation and like I said oxidative phosphorylation is used in respiration to convert ADP to ATP. Thank you. We will then complete the next part in the next lecture.